I do means something. It's bigger than you. <laughs> Welcome back to Mix Presents Sound for a Film Awards season. I'm Tom Kenny, the editor of Mix Magazine, and we're here to talk about Babylon. I mean, out of Paramount, director Damien Chazelle, uh, coming out on December 23rd, I should mention, uh, with director Damien Chazelle, and we have a team that has worked with him uh, for a couple of films now, uh, starting with La La Land. We have Stephen Morrow, a production sound. We have Mildred Yetra Morgan, a supervising sound editor, I Ling Lee and Andy Nelson, uh, who are the re-recording mixers, but I Ling has a sound design supervising credit in a lot of the central points here. So we have a big ensemble film uh, from a period when it goes from Hollywood goes from the silence to the talkies. And uh, when you have a, I think Andy, you called it a boisterous film. Uh, Stephen, these are a challenge. A big cast, big locations, lots going on. Let's start with the dialogue. You have to hear everything. So what was it like for you? I mean, the film is, uh, it's an epic film and we had, you know, we had multiple locations a, a day. Sometimes we would, uh, almost never be in the same spot for more than a, you know, a few scenes. Um, and so it's, it's one of those movies, um, that, you know, is a challenge because you're always moving around. And the, the other part of it is there's a lot of great sunrise and sunset shots in the film. And to get those, Sometimes you span them over a, a you know a week long period, so you're filming the, this big battle scene and, and the Brad Pitt Brad Pitt character's first kiss, you know, on 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 film, and that took um, five days in Simi Valley in 110 degree heat with you know 1,200 extras, and we would film on the battle scene during the you know the battlefield during the day, and we'd climb up the mountain right you know 20 minutes before sunset to get the perfect sunset shot, and we did that for five days straight. So those are, you know, it's a challenging, challenging movie, you know, and, and most of the sets were, were practical. Uh, is your boob guy running around? Did you have a bag and everything? Are you running through? No, because the, the, the big deal about going, you know, down on the battlefield, we had, um, you know, back in the, the non talky days, there would be a live orchestra playing for the cast in the movie. And uh, so on the battlefield, we'd have a full orchestra and up on top of the hill we'd have a full orchestra it would be the same people but in those scenarios you would play back the orchestrated music in earwigs so earpieces and so every every orchestra member would have an earwig um and then we would play back and so the equipment was it was necessary to have a lot of equipment uh, to be able to handle all the playback and also to be able to cue uh, you know, the 1,200 extras, you needed a big PA system to be able to, to tell everybody to stop playing. 1,200 extras. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a big set. Yeah, it's, Andy, a, it's a big set. Andy, you receive those those tracks. I mean, uh, what are they like when they come in? I mean, is it busy? Well, uh, no, I mean, the, 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 like most directors, Damien loves his production sound. Uh, rightly so. So every everything effort is made to to retain that as much as possible. And we were able to use a lot of it in this film because it was terrific, thanks to Steve's great work. And um, and, and on that, look, it's always a challenge because particularly, as Steve said, with that number of people, those types of scale of sets were huge sometimes. And um, to capture everything uh, was was very tough. So obviously, there's enhancement that goes on throughout the dialogue. But in general, it was it was great. There was, a, there was some really terrific stuff that um, that came through. And I think it's all in the movie. And we're very, very proud of that. And you consider this a lot of dialogue. I mean, there's some fast stuff that I, I saw oh, in, the, the, in the preview and everything. Oh, plenty. This is thick, heavy, yeah. heavy yeah, story. I mean, there, there was a bit of a cheat in the script, I would say. You know, when you read the script, it's line, then the next line, then the next line. Our script was line, 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 line. So each, you know, instead of it being a page, you know, to a minute, it's almost, you know, two minutes worth of dialogue in one page. But since the, the dialogue was, you know, kind of overlapping and, and delivered all at the same time, it, it becomes a, you know, a quicker 
you know, seen than, than you would read. But there was double the dialogue on 90% of the pages, yeah. Yeah, and also, I mean, you know, that, that's on the script. Wait till, it's, wait till the picture's cut. Now, now all the little tiny gaps have come out and this dialogue's even faster and closer and more overlapped. So, um, yeah, there was a it was quite a handful, but it was terrific the way it came through. You could definitely call this movie Altman-esque in terms of um, not just overlapping dialogue, simultaneous dialogue, which again, I love the way Steve, Steve Mike's everybody, which is fantastic. And you can always dig out the dialogue. Like there's a scene in the tent. I don't know if you, you saw that, you remember that scene, but it's where we, early on when we meet Brad Pitt and, and there's a, it's in the middle of the battle and everybody in the tent says something. And then we added more lines and, but you could hear everything. So it, it's crazy, but it's great. The amazing thing about that scene is the first time we do it, they have all these air cannons just exploding off camera to blow the dirt all over the tent. And it was, it, the, the whole thing was completely unusable. And after the first take, I'm like, that's how you guys going to throw dirt through this whole scene. We're never going to hear the dialogue. I said, can you get a bunch of guys with shovels or buckets throwing the dirt? And so that's from take two on, that's how they did it. But otherwise they had all these, you know, effects guys blowing air cannons off camera. And I was like, you can't, we can't do that. I like I like that much. I mean, uh, heavy, rapid dialogue, fast cut. That that's a challenge for sound effects to fit in when you have to. Yeah, re- like speaking of those battlefield scenes, we actually uh, because of like it had like twelve hundred extras for like a day or two during the shoot, and so um, we sent out like you know our effects recorders and uh, uh, another effects editor, um, um, John Fasal and like Tim Walston out to set uh, one one of those days with those huge crowd days and um, to help you know, cover more recordings of the all the extras um, in the battle sounds and and then like John would walk with his quad uh, um, mic um, in the crowd behind the camera as they're filming it um, and just so it feels like you know we are in the crowd uh, during the battle we also like they also did some takes where I feel like uh, it's mostly just because I also told them like, you know, it would be good to also get some um, those props like with like hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of like prop weapons, you know, sounding like real weapons, you know, uh, so recorded that and uh, the set explosion, practical explosions that were used and stuff. Uh, so vehicles, um, vehicles, vehicles um, we recorded later. Uh, we did try recording some uh, on set, but most of them, unfortunately, oh. were uh, replaced with like newer engines, like some Toyota engines, because they need something that's reliable to drive rather than hundred-year-old cars. Right. But we did source hundred-year-old cars to record. We um, did try on set, but we instantly, you know, the the, the the car guys were like, "These are all Toyota engines." I was like, "Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no point." <laughs> We want it to be like more authentic, but that's uh, that's a, another segment that we can talk about. Well, later. I would like actually, that's Mildred. I mean, how how important was period uh, period effects, period sound? I mean, I know he will enhance. I know he'll stylize, but is the root all period effects? Well, it's interesting because um, we we wanted a contemporary sound and a contemporary look from the film, meaning that you're there, it's happening around you. But everything, like Eileen and her team were amazing in terms of recording authentic, like the projectors, the moviolas, the cars, the, I don't know, what else? I mean, so many, and then worldizing things and speakers from the period. So in terms of what's in the movie, everything is 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 um, authentic. We got the props department who also, you know, as they were filming a lot of those like period moviolas, the hand crank cameras, motorized cameras, even down to wood tripods and like um, Victrola recorder, uh, uh, record player, sorry, and phone rings and stuff. Um, we uh, source them from production uh, that they have rented out or purchased. Um, and I had the uh, film, histo- I have a film historian uh, around to help operate it for us. Yeah. And, uh, and we uh, recorded them all. Um, to reuse and then for the vehicle stuff like say that's a in the opening scene of the movie um, that's an elephant scene um, so um, because like um, uh, what you call it uh, because the filmmakers couldn't use real elephants to film 
So it's mostly at practical practical effects elephant and the effects elephant. So, you know, with the sound, we had to, um, you know, um, help give it some life to well, help ground it. You had to invent the elephant, essentially. Yeah, it yeah. It was never really there. And then Damien wanted it to be like, to sound real visceral and larger than life. And so I did a lot of like research, watching YouTube videos of like real elephant peeing and pooping. Um, and it already sounded really big. So I was like, oh, okay, I guess we got to go bigger than that. Um, so, uh, so, you know, so, so we had to create sounds for that, for the elephant pooping part. Somebody okay. will know the correct sound out there. That's the thing. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. An important and, and also to help uh, sell that the truck is under load. So we found like mm -hmm. a 19, early 1920s um, Ford Model TT truck. Brought it to uh, Calif California City Airport, rented out the airport, and um, hooked it up to tow uh, a modern truck. So and recorded the sound of the engine that way to kind of recreate it to be as though it's under stress, under load. Yeah, because when we when we were filming that scene, there was no. I mean, the cars weren't weren't working, right? They would just hook them up with a cable, and the cable was strung, you know, four thousand feet away and hooked up to a, you know, to a. a truck from transportation they would drag it up a hill via the cable a giant crane and then down into the valley so this thing was, was it was quiet when they were pulling it up which was great so whatever you know what you guys added to that to make it sound like that thing was struggling that's the important part of that scene is just that it i like what you said earlier about uh the stuff from production both having an effects recorders going out and i, I see they've been hearing more and more about gathering production effects and stuff i mean what what uh, what does that do for you in terms of uh, sort of setting the tone and not having to use Foley all the time or wanting to use Foley all the time? And Mildred, let's, well, how does getting that either wild tracks or production effects help? Well, um, having the real thing helps, is, um, but unless it's a situation like what Eileen was saying, where it like the truck the truck or the car isn't period um, and then it's it's also good as a reference um, and uh, I mean I don't know Eileen what, I, what else sort of ground you does the, that, that production ground well, I, mean, I only I only um, I the kind of work that I'm focused on I'm only using production sound and unless unless like I, Eileen will say to me Millie mute that that phone ring or whatever because that's not period you know that's not correct and that she'll she'll uh, replace it with a better one. So there's like a lot of back and forth over that stuff. But m most of the stuff I deal with is production sound. And then when I go and record more, I want it to like the ADR and the loop group, I need it to sound as close to the production as possible. So yeah, it's, it's my reference. It's very important to capture as much as possible. There's no doubt, because even if you end up not using it and replacing it, to have it there as a guide, and, and often it just gives a little bit of weight to the scene and uh reality to be honest with you so we we love it wherever that stuff is captured is yeah. we, we always try and use it yeah it's like say for example in the movie you know there's this scene uh when manny sees um the first sound film uh the jazz singer and um you know i think they had also it's another like several hundred extras day of filming and so same thing like we send out um John and Tim over uh, to set that night uh, all day um, and uh, recorded the crowds. Um, they did many, many takes, but of course, you know, a lot of them had the playback from Jess Singer tied into some of that crowd sounds. But because um, it was such a natural performance uh, reaction, natural reaction from the crowd, from those several hundreds, um, when we reuse it, you know, it's kind of hard to re-mimic it that something that's not performed naturally for a reaction for that scene. Well, maybe we could, uh, with the remaining couple of minutes, we could go around and just sort of like talk about a scene that you particularly like. I mean, whether it was challenging or whether it was fun. I mean, Steve, uh, 1,200 extra sounds like a pretty challenging scene. I mean, that's a fun, that's a fun scene. That's, you know, one of those scenes that you, you know, you show up to set and it looks like they built a, a city. Uh, you know, to support all those extras, you have to feed them and, um, you know, make sure there's restrooms for everything. But I, I got to say my favorite scene, which is probably obvious to anybody listening, is the scene with the sound. 
first first time there's a sound you know sound guy scene uh, where, where Margot Robbie is you know trying to understand where to stand under her mic and the sound guy at that moment in you know cinema history is the king of the set and it's all based on what he says and what he does so that was uh, that actor was real fun and he had a good time and he did he did his research and what he was supposed to do what he was supposed to say. Um, I mean, it comes off <laughs> pretty bad, but it's 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 a fun. That was a fun day. It's not often the sound guy gets the close gets their close up. Yeah, um, in a sense, Mildred. I mean, what do you take away? I mean, it's, it sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, it was a lot of work, but it, I I enjoyed it so much. And it was there were all these little challenges. Like my favorite scene, and one of the bigger challenges was when Nellie, her first day on set, when she goes to Kinescope Pictures, and she it's just like this traveling shot. You move through like it's it's out in the desert. There's hundreds of people, like dozens of sets, noise coming fr- and sound coming from all of them, and and Steve mic'd everybody mm-hmm. so that. And then, so I, I kind of did a preliminary cut on all the dialogue production stuff. And then I gave it to Eileen and then she did like a little preliminary so that she could pan it with the sound design. That was, that was so much fun. Andy and Eileen, I mean, you have fun mixing it. I imagine, uh, I imagine it was a busy, probably still on it. I, I don't know. Are you still on it? There's so many scenes, it's hard to even pick one. I, I mean, I, I do love what Steve said about the first sound recording scene, because that's kind of a classic. It's an audience favorite for sure. It's a lovely scene of profi- pr- um, precision, but um, ultimately so many things, of course, keep going wrong. And uh, the poor sound guy, by the way, doesn't get treated very well at all in that moment. <laughs> They but never do. They never do. Yeah. <laughs> so I, uh, I'm very fond of that. I also love the big battlefield sequence because the orchestra's just blasting out and everyone's just having the greatest time. And then all of a sudden they go to lunch and it's pretty fun. Great scene as well. Mix-wise, um, I like the, um, uh, the the sequence of scenes when um starts off with the battlefield scene um, when um, Manny had to kind of save the shoot and drive his truck to a camera store to rent um, a camera because they just broke their last camera and they need to make the shot before sunset. And it intercuts with like uh, um, Manny trying to get to the camera store and back and uh, Jack, who is Brad Pitt, you know, getting drunk and you know, in the in the battlefield tent, and then to Nellie shooting her first ta- uh, uh, silent film scene, and I feel like um, mix wise, you know, um, the 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 music kind of helps us, you know, stitch it up to mm-hmm. build into a crescendo. But uh, in between all of that, uh, I feel there's so many planes of action for uh, all of us, you know, like to pick it, to pick out like what dialogue lines to hit the cut more or. Mm-hmm props, uh, or, I mean, or foley or effects, what to play more. And then when they start filming, how little, how much of the camera, different cameras on the different sets to play under through all the dialogue and music. I just thought um, mm. it was a very careful choice of control, you know, um, amount of like yeah. stuff from all of us. Um, and then um, can I just add, um, the sound design stuff, um, I'm agreeing with Millie. Uh, for me, it's also uh, when Nally first arrives for the first time to a, to a film set at the Kinoscope. Um, it's, uh, you know, like taking all the multi-tracks uh, that Steve did and then Millie, like, uh, kind of ed- uh, edited the dialogue. And, and, and in there, um, there's also production music from Justin um, for the different, each she walks through by different film sets, like, you know, there's an African film set next to like um, um, to some guy, you know, a Fatty Arbuckle, like, you know, comedy stuff to some like Chinese film set with like Lama and stuff. So there's all these layers of different styles of like construction sounds and musical instruments and animals and cameras whirring in directions and stuff. So, um, to, to keep it all alive and panning through them and you know, all around us is to, to build into this cacophony, this controlled chaos, mm-hmm. so that we can have a separation between this crazy, um, like anything can go um, um, sound film set and contrast it to like a pure silent sound 
fact when we first established um, Nelly's, um, you know, first talkie, uh, first sound talkie so, scene. Yeah. yeah. I just love it. I just love it with the visual style gets matched so well with sound. I mean, when they when they work together well, would you just describe that scene of walking past five sets? I could. I could I could almost see it and hear it and hear the elephant peeing or whatever. And by the way, just one final thing, Damien, as as a director, is highly collaborative, highly involved, and he sits when we're mixing. I mean, he is literally sitting between myself and Eileen, and is part of the mixing crew essentially because every single detail, everything is is a collaboration with him and uh, he, he's very involved in this, which. Would... Yeah. I, I, it's the same. It's the same on set. Everything that you see is, is in his head and it's, you know, the job of, of the crew that are making the movie to make sure we get exactly what he's thinking because he's thought this thing through so far, that, you know, it's, it's precision that he, he, he needs. And, and we'll do, you know, 50 takes if it needs to be to just get exactly what he's thinking he needs. Best of luck to you all at Oscar shortlist and uh, everybody go vote and then see this in a theater. It deserves it.